So welcome to this seminar or launch of two policy papers called Creeping Finlandization or Protecting National Interests, Georgia's Strategic Dilemmas uh, Amid the Ukrainian Crisis. My name is Helge Blokisura. I'm a senior researcher at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs in, in Oslo. And it's my pleasure to, to host this uh, seminar here today. This is a joint seminar between uh, the Georgian Institute of Politics and the Norwegian Institute of International uh, Affairs, connected to uh, a project that we have been running now together for uh, almost four years, uh, called Competency Through Cooperation, Advancing Knowledge on Georgia's Strategic Path, or, or Geopath uh, in, in short, a project uh, funded by the Research Council of, of Norway where we uh, explore the triadic nexus between Georgia, the EU, and, and Russia, and uh, in addition to that, also within this triadic nexus, uh, the relationship to the breakaway entities. Um, today, we will hear uh, some results from this project, two uh, policy memos that have uh, been recently published uh, one uh, published as a, a GIP policy memo and the other as a, a PONARS memo. PONARS, for those who are not familiar with, the, with, with that abbreviation, is the Programme on New Approaches to Research and Security in Eurasia. It's a, a, a US-based network of, of uh, US, European and uh, Eurasian researchers. Uh, I should say before we proceed that uh, the whole event will be uh, will be filmed. It will not be streamed, but uh, we will uh, make a recording and it will be published on GIPs and uh, NUPIs websites after the event. If you want to go back and, and listen to it once again or or uh, spread the word to, to some of your colleagues. Uh, and I would also... Uh, you take the opportunity to, to uh, inform that after the event, uh, uh, when we're wrapping up, there will be some light refreshments and, and time for, for mingling and, and, and continuing the discussion uh, 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 over some coffee and, and light refreshments. But uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to, to move to the first of um, uh, the policy memos that we are going to present, and that will uh, be one uh, authored by uh, Corneli Kakaccia and Shota Kakabadza, called Creeping Finlandization or Pragmatic Foreign Policy, Georgia's Strategic Challenges uh, Amid the Ukrainian Crisis. Please, Corneli. Thank you very much, uh, uh, I feel a little bit strange because normally I'm host here, and now it appears that I'm speaker and you hosting the event, but that's uh, how this happens in academic world. Uh, first of all, I would like to greet all uh, uh, attendees who actually found the time to uh, to come and to attend this um, our seminar. It shows that topic which we actually choose for discussion is uh, very, very appropriate, and um, it's actually uh, something which uh, which is important for the country and for region. As, and as you know, uh, things are uh, really um, how does it changing like over uh, every day and we don't know even what will be the outcome of this conflict uh, uh, and war actually Russian invasion of uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, of course these events uh, will affect not only the Ukraine but all, uh, all the region including Georgia and uh, of course Georgians uh, we always uh, have a special feeling to Ukraine because uh, it's uh, we consider it's like twin seat, uh, twin uh, country and uh, of course we have a strategy strategic partnership with Ukraine and of course what is happening in Ukraine and what will be the future of Ukraine that will uh, dramatically uh, affect the uh, security of Georgia and also Black Sea security. So this was the kind of like uh, idea when we started together with Chota to draft this uh, memo. Uh, first, uh, we wrote actually policy paper in Georgian because um, our main target was the Georgian audience. So that, this paper is av available in our website. That's a little bit longer, 30 pages. And then uh, because uh, it was written before the conflict, we just uh, thought that some things, you know, like change there. So that's why we wrote English version for Poners. And basically today we will um, uh, try to 
uh, present this, um, uh, I mean, some mix of the Georgian and uh, uh, English version of this uh, policy paper. So major uh, issue which we're discussing in this policy memo is that recent, uh, I, I, would, I, I don't know if I can call this recent, uh, because I actually the changes of Georgian foreign policy actually, which started 2012, after the, uh, you know, the Georgian dream came to the power, uh, you know, there, there was a change of the foreign policy, um, how to say, rhetoric, and not only rhetoric, but also behavior. And we have few academic uh, articles together with Lewan about that. Uh, but um, uh, uh, the things, it, things are changing even right now and in recent years uh, with the uh, Georgian dream still in power. And I, uh, I think the most interesting was to, uh, to look at the how the Georgian uh, dream was, um, uh, I mean, dealing with Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian conflict. And um, that actually also showed uh, that, you know, how different are the, how different were the, for instance, former, uh, f foreign policies of the former government with UNM and the Georgian dream. And it's not, uh, when we're talking about the foreign policy, we have to understand that this foreign policy, um, actually, differences is not only, um, I would say, uh, based on ideology or something, this also uh, there's also a very important part which comes from the internal party politics, and that also affects uh, sometimes uh, this our foreign policy. Uh, uh, so, uh, okay, I think we have a technical problem here uh, for. Uh, uh, so for slide, but uh, maybe I should continue. I think one of the issue which were, what we wanted wanted to discuss in this um, uh, policy memo, you can understand this from even the, reading the title: "Creeping Finlandization or Prudent Foreign Policy." Basically, we are trying to explain, um, you know, the uh, readers. Uh, how you can perceive this uh, current uh, foreign policy, which is uh, actually carried out by Georgian Dream? Some people uh, think, uh, including us, probably that this is something which really looks like Finlandization. And when we use this term, uh, uh, we mean that uh, you know, like that, informally, uh, uh, country can be part of great, greater Europe, or even, in best case scenario, uh, part of European Union. But uh, Finlandization means, in these terms, uh, that uh, country still, uh, the country who is neighboring of the Russia still has some uh, limited sovereignty. So it means that, uh, like in Finland during the Cold War, uh, there can be this uh, model that when Russia actually um, how to say, like interferes or controls the foreign policy decision making. So uh, that's a one way, and, uh, but of course the government uh, wants to sell it a little bit differently, and uh, they, um, as we can see, like all, almost like daily rhetoric, that government wants to say that this is actually prudent foreign policy based on our national interest. And we had a discussion uh, just uh, one month ago when we actually uh, GAP organized uh, uh, discussion where we invited the politicians actually how, uh, in order to discuss what is the national interest of Georgia. Unfortunately, the ruling party didn't come. The all opposition party leaders, they came. So it also shows that you know, we cannot even talk about the, what is our national interest. And that's, uh, uh, that's why it's very difficult to understand when uh, when the ruling party talks about uh, uh, foreign policy, which is based national interest, because we don't have the common definition anymore. And unfortunately, what was uh, missing in uh, also that a uh, few years ago, or almost like 10 years uh, back, we had, uh, as, as you know, the Georgians, we disagree on many, many things. But uh, there was one issue where we had a kind of consensus. It was foreign policy and security issues. But it seems like recent events and uh, recent failure of the Georgian parliament to adopt a uh, you know, like resolution on Ukraine shows that uh, even on foreign policy, we don't have anymore the consensus. Because uh, as you know, the opposition parties didn't sign this ag uh, agreement because um, you know, there was not mentioning, I mean, in this uh, document was not mentioned Russia as a, a kind of force who actually uh, was, uh, invaded the Ukraine. So it seems like uh, uh, this uh, vision that we had a uh, kind of consensus on foreign policy is, uh, is not uh, reality anymore, unfortunately, uh, which uh, puts Georgia in a little bit um, in a very strange position uh, because 
Uh, basically, the huge, uh, the huge problem we, we are, which we have with the current foreign policy is that there's a two points I want to uh, raise here. First, the uh, foreign policy which we have right now is um, against the public opinion. And uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you now the slides, but maybe, yeah, uh, yeah, actually, maybe you can uh, move next one. Should look a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, according to the public opinion polls, there is a huge mismatch uh, between public expectations and government actions. And I think this is already problematic because foreign policy should serve somehow and should be in line with the public, uh, um, you know, like uh, moods. And uh, uh, that's a one problem uh, which we can see. And of course. Uh, some of you have seen thousands of Georgians actually supporting Ukraine uh, in the recent demonstrations. So I think um, this was um, uh, very puzzling for many people, including Georgia and also friends of Georgia uh, outside of the uh, country, uh, why Georgian government actually behaves like this. Because uh, Georgia and Ukraine are strategic partners. We are also together in the associated trio. Uh, and we had this, you know, like a, a very long lasting relations, uh, irreversible, I mean, despite who was the ruling the country. And uh, I think the, um, when we, what we try to explain in this memo is also that um, first is to explain the why actually government um, uh, wants to sell it like um, uh, foreign policy which is based on national interest and then uh, what is the uh, real uh, problems which I will talk a little bit later. Then uh, I want to also show the next uh, slide um, uh, which also shows that uh, you know the mood of the uh, public opinion about this uh, issue and um, Second point which I also wanted to uh, mention is that uh, this current foreign policy is also contradicts our uh, constitutional changes which was made a um, uh, few years ago uh, when actually government and opposition um, you know, agreed that uh, like in the Ukrainian constitution it was enshrined that, uh, in constitution that Georgia will, uh, will become member of NATO and European Union. So the Foreign policy, which is uh, pursued right now, and um, which main idea of this foreign policy is not to irritate Russia, and uh, uh, it started long ago, and it had some, uh, you know, like uh, positive development at the beginning uh, with the trade in cultural exchange, but it didn't really translate into uh, changes like probably Georgian government expected. And one of the reasons of this that we have to accept uh, that uh, national interest of Russia and Georgia does not coincide, and they actually clash, and that's the problem. And despite what kind of government will come to Russia or Georgia, I think they cannot, um, you know, like uh, change this uh, situation uh, um, so fast. And I think this is more uh, important right now because what we see is now with this revanchist Russia um, um, and the Russian leadership who actually wants to have uh, some sort of, um, how to say, like uh, influence on the former Soviet space, uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, chances of the cooperation even shrinking even uh, more. So uh, I think this puts uh, Georgia a little bit in a difficult situation and uh, one of the biggest problems Georgia has is that there is a feeling that Georgia is getting a little bit isolated internationally. And you can feel this from our partners uh, in Europe or United States. And I think this, there's uh, some risk that if we, uh, we pursue this kind of foreign policy, which actually alienates our friends and uh, strategic friends and actually makes happy Moscow, I think that we should think that that something is wrong. Maybe I'll just stop here. This was just kind of like um, kind of introduction and I will be more than happy to engage with you in Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you, Cornelia. And uh, for all of those interested in reading more about this, of course, it's possible to download this uh, policy memo uh, for free from the Polnar's uh, website. Uh, we'll now move directly to to the second uh, policy memo, uh, which is written by uh, Levon Kukishvili, uh, protecting national interest and or abandoning strategic partners. Um, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, and the way Corneli finished uh, his talk ties very well with what I want to talk about. Um, today. So um, the idea behind this uh, document uh, came about 
after the very first statement by the government of Georgia, I mean, Prime Minister of Georgia, Irak Lihari Bashvili, um, that the war was in Ukraine and he had his job. Um, and we've seen since then um, um, a, a lot of criticism of Georgian government uh, and a lot of um, argumentation from the uh, Georgian Dream, uh, representatives of Georgian Dream, about how Georgian Dream is protecting national interests of Georgia and how the policy of uh, Georgian Dream is in line with protecting national interests of Georgia. However, the primary question uh, I would like to ask is whether what Georgia is doing currently is protecting national interests or abandoning strategic partners. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, talk uh, very briefly, mention a few signs of deep frustration uh, in Ukraine uh, regarding uh, the positions of, uh, of, of Georgian government uh, since the start of the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we've seen at the very early stages, we've seen uh, tweets uh, from President Zelensky and Prime Minister Shmiha um, that were very critical um, of Georgian government, um, but supportive of uh, the public demonstrations that were held in Tbilisi. We had uh, a statement uh, from the President Zelensky about how the uh, position of, on, on sanctions of uh, Georgia was immoral, and we had recalling of the ambassador, uh, which uh, the most recent development in the last few days uh, was that uh, Zelensky is not very happy with the performance of, of the ambassador, which means that he's not happy about the position of the Georgian government. Um, so these are uh, signs of frustration that we all very uh, uh, all know very well. Um, now I would like to uh, briefly touch uh, the importance of Georgian-Ukrainian relations. First of all, uh, Ukraine is a strategic partner of Georgia, and we've had uh, four strategic partners. Um, uh, this is the United States, Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Ukraine. And more recently, uh, we are trying to develop strategic uh, partnership with the UK and Poland and Romania. Uh, but Ukraine is one of the four uh, countries that we identify as uh, strategic partners. However, in 2015, uh, Georgian Dream adopted uh, a foreign policy strategy and removed Ukraine from the list of strategic partners. Um, Against this background, we have uh, uh, some sort of st tensions between Georgia and Ukraine regarding uh, uh, Saakashvili and uh, United National Movement representatives or former bureaucrats from Georgia going to Ukraine and getting jobs in the government of Ukraine. Um, uh, Georgian Dream was, uh, Georgian government was demanding extradition of Saakashvili, which was not happening. Um, However, in 2017, Poroshenko's visit uh, was um, in the framework of the Poroshenko's visit. Um, an agreement on strategic, strategic partnership was signed, and two days later, Saakashvili was deported to Poland. So these developments hint at uh, the conclusion that uh, there was uh, issues uh, of domestic politics from Georgia uh, were influencing uh, Georgian-Ukrainian relationships and how Georgian government viewed Ukraine as a partner. Um, at, at the same time, we had, since the uh, 2012 parliamentary elections when Georgian Dream came to power, we've had the narrative of the Georgian Dream um, and the normalization policy, um, uh, which in the framework of which um, representatives of Georgian Dream would call it a mistake, a big mistake, uh, to compare the state of Ukraine uh, and its position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia uh, to uh, the state of Georgia. Uh, it was the Prime Minister uh, back then, Irak Lihari Bashvili, which called it a big mistake on the, during the interview with BBC to compare Ukraine and Georgia with each other. Um, at the same time, uh, you can see in the chart that um, uh, Georgia and Ukraine have uh, signed more than 100 bilateral agreements, and for comparison, you have other post-Soviet countries, um, uh, which, which talks about the intensity of political ties between the two countries. And at the same time, we have this uh, um, inter-party uh, 
competition, contestation of various issues influencing the bilateral relationships. Now this goes um, uh, a little further. Uh, here what we have is analysis of uh, party manifestos um, of the UNM and Georgian Dream and analysis of strategic documents adopted by uh, uh, since the 2008 August war. This is national security concept which was adopted by the UNM government. Uh, this is national military strategy that, that was adopted by um, Georgian Dream government and two foreign policy strategies adopted again by the Georgian Dream government. The UNM logos here indicate the manifesto um, data, uh, Georgian Dream logos here and here indicate the manifesto data of the Georgian Dream. So what we see here is that um, <coughs> positions, uh, uh, this is a two-dimensional uh, plane which uh, um, is composed of two dimensions, right? Uh, first is perception of Russia, uh, whether positive or negative, and perception of West, positive or negative. Uh, important thing is that all documents perceive Russia as negative, and all documents perceive West as positive, but there are still differences. For example, the UNM manifestos are very consistent, and they are constellated uh, very close together. Um, but the GD documents, it started in 2012 here and then moved less negative uh, to about Russia um, in 2016 and 2020. Um, and now they are starting to consolidate positions here, um, which is less negative about Russia. The same goes for the direction of changes uh, in terms of the positioning in strategic documents. Um, national military strategy adopted by GD uh, was very negative of Russia. Foreign policy strategies, two of them consecutively, less negative of Russia, um, but more positive about West. Um, what this uh, is indicating is how Georgian dream uh, is influencing government positioning, how uh, government bureaucracy is influencing Georgian Dream's positioning in their own party manifestos. So uh, there is a very close link between what uh, members of the uh, party uh, say and what uh, is written in the documents that the government is adopting and that is defining national interests of Georgia. Um, Speaking of uh, um, uh, this influence of, uh, uh, th that the party has over the government positioning, uh, I have to say that there are two problems um, about the government of Georgia's response to war in Ukraine. One is logical and the other is perceptual. Uh, Georgian governments, including the Georgian Dreams uh, government, have adopted a security strategy which is international as opposed to national. National strategy would be focusing on increasing uh, self-reliance and decreasing vulnerabilities, while international strategy is more about um, uh, partnering up with stronger powers um, to increase own security, which is why Georgia has been trying to integrate with NATO, right? And this is a declared goal in all the documents that we looked at earlier. In this context, such an international strategy uh, is dependent on success of it, is dependent on uh, management of uh, uh, relations with partners. So if we don't manage relations of part with partners very well, if our partners feel abandoned by us, then we are facing a logical problem. We cannot increase our security through an international strategy if we are not ready to be part of that partnership. Perceptual par problem would refer to what are perceived as facts and what is the symbolic importance of these facts and how our partners are perceiving these things. For example, um, um, we are under, I mean, the Georgian government right now is underestimating how important, even in, in, in symbolic terms, how important it is for Ukraine to see Georgia as a strong supporter. 
uh, of its uh, security and uh, sovereignty. Um, having a policy of mild appeasement towards Russia is perceived as abandoning strategic partners. And this is something that uh, uh, should be uh, clearly emphasized. And towards the end, I would like to finish up with uh, four questions. Are we observing the, the government of Georgia's strategy or tactics? If it was tactics, probably there would be a lot of work behind curtains to reassure our strategic partners that it's just tactics and strategy has not changed. However, the frustration, signs of frustrations that I talked about in the beginning of this talk would suggest otherwise. Second, under what assumptions does the government of Georgia operate? Um, Government of Georgia assumes that its actions influence the policy of Russia towards Georgia. This is probably not the case. Uh, any specialist of Russian foreign policy would tell us uh, that Russia will do whatever it pleases, and what, no matter what Georgian government will, uh, what sort of policy uh, Georgian government will have. What are the goals of the Russian foreign policy then? Um, there are two main goals: uh, limiting the penetration of Western powers in its near abroad, including Georgia, and establishing limited sovereignties in its neighborhood. So Georgia has to think about whether it's acceptable uh, to have limited sovereignty and to refuse or say no to making important decisions in its foreign and security policy. And finally, in what scenario do the actions and statements of the Georgian government matter? This may seem paradoxical, but the only scenario that our actions matters is if Ukraine prevails and if, if Russia comes out defeated. Um, this is because be, um, if Ukraine prevails, um, then uh, our partners will start thinking about who was supporting them. And if we are not on the good side of them, then we have failed in our own uh, international strategy of security policy making. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Levan. I hope for a nice, interesting discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Levan. Um, before we move to the general discussion, I open up the floor for, for questions and interventions. Um, we have uh, inside our Geopath team uh, decided to pr provide two outside views on, on uh, these uh, policy memos uh, by. Uh, two team members, Geopath team members. So uh, we will have uh, two interventions from the Ge Geopath project. First from uh, Ketvan Bokvatsa from Lund University and then from my colleague at uh, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, Julie Wilhelmsen. But we'll, we'll start with Ketvan. Uh, oh, thanks to uh, NUPI and GIP for organizing this very, very timely event. And also thanks to the presenters for incredibly interesting findings. So what I will try to do, I, was, I will try to expand on these findings by situating them in the broader context of European integration and security of Georgia. And I think that Julie will continue with more of NATO and North Atlantic perspective. So just a couple of weeks ago, um, one of the GD lawmakers uh, was interviewed by New York Times, where he tried to explain the dilemmas uh, facing Georgia in the following words. And I'm quoting him here. Uh, he said, we live next to a volcano. The volcano just erupted, and it just happens that the lava is currently flowing on the other side of the mountain. And by this, he tried to explain the self-imposed um, restrictions or what Gornelli and Schotta described as uh, Finlandization. And uh, one thing that we have to give it to the GD lawmakers is that the risks can hardly be overstated, right? I mean, if there's someone who knows the horrors of war with Russia, it's definitely Georgia. Um, but the fundamental question that we should be asking ourselves is if uh, standing alone in front of a volcano uh, in isolation is really the best uh, strategy to deal with the current uh, risks and with the current crisis. Um, because one of the possible outcomes of the current policy, as Cornelio also mentioned, is that we, Georgia might end up uh, isolating itself from, the, from its friends and uh, strategic partners. 
Um, and again, I think both uh, Levan's and uh, Cornelius' papers made very, very clear reference to that, right? I don't believe that by refusing to join sanctions, uh, Georgia has necessarily decreased the risks of escalation or even war, right? If there's one thing we know when dealing with uh, Russia is that it's very, very difficult to talk about any kinds of guarantees. We've seen Georgian government um, pursuing the policy of normalization, but uh, the so-called borderization has continued. It does not affect it whatsoever. But on the other side of the equation, we see with increasing clarity that the uh, relationship is becoming more and more strained and even lukewarm between Georgia and its strategic um, partners, whether it's Ukraine or the traditional allies such as the um, EU and the US. Um, and when we, uh, when we talk about security, we also have to acknowledge that security um, is not only about the military dimension, right? It is about political dimension. It has um, huge implications for um, uh, quality of democracy in the country, and that it's on its own has uh, important implication for the country's European integration. And then there's, of course, economic dimension, trade, transportation. Um, and uh, Levan had mentioned in the memo that one of the trends that we've seen increasingly is that often um, narrow party interests are overriding the broad strategic national interests. And that creates a big challenge, big internal challenge for the, uh, for the security of Georgia. And when we talk about trade and transportation, the first uh, example that comes to mind is, of course, the um, Anaklia Deep Sea port, uh, which, uh, which was widely viewed um, as an alternative corridor by Europe to the um, east-west trade, uh, um, uh, east-west land trade, which is, uh, which up until now at least was taking uh, place through Russia. And um, had it materialized, it would have created incentive structures for the EU member states to have more vested interests in protecting uh, Georgia's security and protecting Georgia's uh, borders. Uh, we've seen Mike Pompeo, right, uh, U.S. Secretary of State, throw his, uh, throw his weight behind the project. Uh, we've seen European Commission uh, draft um, an action plan that uh, viewed Anakli as absolutely critical for boosting trade within the Eastern Partnership. But what happened, and I'm sure many of you know, was that it was cancelled in 2020. Um, there have been some talks that the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, could provide some alternative um, funding for countries' infrastructure. But um, there are numerous reports that show that uh, BRI projects in Georgia will not deliver the same level of uh, transparency or sovereignty over critical infrastructure um, ties to European businesses that Anaklia uh, had promised. And you know, we can debate about the potential uh, reasons behind canceling the project, but I think one thing that's clear is that the government, for some reason, did not prioritize something, a project that was absolutely crucial for boosting country's security. Um, and then again, that goes back to Levan's point, point about the narrow party interests. And finally, I have to uh, touch upon Corneli and uh, Shota's point. Um, in the memo about uh, Georgia's security risks being exacerbated uh, by the internal um, political crisis and democratic backsliding. Um, we have to acknowledge that strengthening democratic institutions is uh, part and parcel for strengthening security architecture of Georgia. Georgia is a valuable partner to the EU or the US, NATO, only as long as it upholds its uh, democratic values and rule of law. Um, but again, in this direction, uh, we have not seen uh, many good trends, including the, uh, with, the with the GD government um, moving ahead with the appointment of politicized uh, uh, judiciary and the Supreme uh, Court judges. And that's, um, that's not very good news, of course, for the quality of democracy in uh, Georgia. That only uh, helps the so-called uh, black knights, which are usually referred in the academic literature, which is Russia and China. And that only brings them closer to the uh, black knights.
Uh, so just to wrap up, and I think I'm on time. You're fine. That's fantastic. Um, this might seem like small domestic um, political steps, right? Whether it's anaclia or uh, appointments in the judiciary, but they have huge ramifications for the country's uh, long-term security and European integration. And I think both papers make a really, really good job linking the internal political dynamics with the uh, foreign and security uh, choices of uh, Georgia. I'll stop here and let Julie continue. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And while uh, Julie is making her intervention, please feel free to start signing up for, for the, for the Q&A. Yes, it's working. Good. Uh, thank you for letting uh, us join here with uh, what inevitably will be an outside uh, perspective. And they, my comments are based on the two policy briefs, which I encourage everybody to read. Uh, so my first comment would be that these are very cl clear policy advice for your government, uh, and actually quite, quite similar, the content of your two briefs. And very clear in a situation that we have to admit is extremely unclear. Uh, and I must confess, from my, my own position is as a Russia scholar and as a critical scholar, which means that I'm critical in every direction. So I'm critical towards Russia, but I'm also critical towards the West, which is, uh, in today's uh, tragic situation, very, very difficult because it's, a very, it's very unpopular to keep on uh, holding our own governments accountable. Uh, so I just want to state at the beginning that the guilt for this war is on Russia's side. Still, I want uh, to, um, to give some comments and questions, and they are aimed at poking in what I think is maybe a too simple understanding of the context and some taken for granted net, uh, taken for grantedness of the wider concept, um, um, context which might change rapidly. And the first point I wanted uh, to make that is that I'm afraid that Russia is not as isolated as we have portrayed it in the past uh, four weeks. So I don't think we're in a situation where from now on it will be Russia against the rest, as we would say in IR. Uh, and a, a clear example is the recent visit of Lavrov to um, Beijing, where China and Russia agreed that they together will shape the new world order and that Russia-China cooperation uh, has no limits. Uh, secondly, Lavrov will fly on to India, and I have a feeling it will be a similar account. So that's the first uh, kind of reality check from my side. Um, and then secondly, although uh, the West, NATO, are firmly united uh, against Russia, and it's, this unity is happening through the war, through Russia's war in Ukraine, I have a feeling that the pre-war cracks in Western un uh, unity are going to re-emerge. I also have a feeling that the appetite for NATO enlargement, particularly on membership, is uh, going to decrease, whatever the outcome of this war. Then to uh, uh, the Georgian case, um, case and to Georgian Dream's attempt to, to tone down the anti-Russian uh, rhetoric and, as you have described it, in a way, sacrifice uh, Georgia's partnership with Ukraine in order to uh, appease, so to speak, uh, Russia. So I'm speaking now on the basis of my own study of uh, Russian official discourse on Georgia from 2014 until uh, 2020, which I've studied in detail during those years. And uh, what I find is that, first of all, Russia portrays Georgia and Ukraine as a kind of dangerous pair of twins who together are working to get the West and NATO particularly involved in the region at the cost of Russia and to the detriment of uh, Russia. Moreover, even though the Georgian uh, rhetoric has been dampened, as described by Levan, it hasn't much changed how Russia 
views and speaks of Georgia. So uh, continued NATO engagement, transatlantic practical engagement uh, uh, with Georgia has of course continued in the years after 2014 and this is what Russia follows. So in my many hundreds of texts which I have looked through, uh, an interesting observation is that George, first of all, Georgia hardly figures in Moscow's eyes. When it figures, it's in connection with NATO in particular. Um, so, so that means <laughs> that the analysis of, uh, or yeah, the analysis you have to make and the picture you need to work from when you want to think about strategy for Georgia has to be uh, widened uh, and, and maybe uh, calibrated. So future strategic navigation might better uh, see itself as a potential victim in what I call an international proxy game. So when Russia deals with Georgia, it is not as Georgia, but as the USA or NATO, which it construes as an existential threat to uh, Putin's Russia. And although we don't know what kind of uh, new world we are going to face after this terrible war, it could be uh, the same type of proxy terrain, uh, terrain as defined by Russia. But it might look even more existentially threatening from Moscow's side because NATO engagement might be stepped up uh, on Georgian territory for example, in the Black Sea, where they have access through Georgian territory, in efforts to deter Russia in the Black Sea. And then to disagree a bit with Levant's account on, uh, and perhaps cynically, on how important it is what Georgia now does in relation to Ukraine, you could say that viewed through this proxy prism, which I'm using, it might not matter so much that uh, Georgia was not loyal to, um, to Ukraine because NATO Washington will play up Georgia as its partner uh, in this region to reduce the Russian threat, if that is going to be the game. If the game is going to be this kind of big power interaction where you have territories of proxy where these two actors play each other. Um, so following on from this, you, you both um, indicate in your policy briefs that Georgian Dream has a different foreign policy vision of how the Russian threat can be alleviated. You call it appeasement. Um, and in the current situation of uh, Ukraine being under Russian siege in the way that it is, uh, this type of policy, of course, looks quite uh, despicable in a way, immoral. Uh, but I still wanted to put in there <laughs> uh, the Norwegian strategy, if you like which you could call a type of appeasement, but you could also call it something else, and Norway definitely doesn't call it appeasement. But Norway is, as Georgia, a small country bordering on Russia, but it is an old NATO member. And Norway's policy has always been, as a NATO member, to strike a balance between deterring uh, the Soviet Union and then Russia, but reassuring uh, Russia through very concrete mechanisms such as no foreign bases on Norwegian soil, no military exercises too close uh, to the Russian border to reassure Russia that Norwegian territory is not going to be used as a launch pad for US military power. So this is a conscious self-imposed, which is very different from the notion of appeasement, because appeasement is something, is kind of a dictate by somebody else. So it's, it's in a way more sovereign, it's self-imposed. 
And it's the strategy, it's not tactics. It's a many, many, many years old strategy. So I think I'm running out of time, but my point was, I wonder whether, uh, Corneli, there is a third way here. So, not a Finlandization, which has a very negative tint to it, uh, and not a head-on uh, path into NATO, which I think is quite unrealistic. Anyway, I'm sorry to say so, but I, I really think so, and particularly from the Western side. But uh, something, something in between, maybe a more low-key NATO engagement. And my last point would be, uh, and based on my reading of the Russian sources, decoupling the NATO and the EU track. Because I don't think a uh, head-on uh, um, track into EU is, a bit, not according to my readings at least, is a big problem for Russia. It is NATO which is uh, the big problem, and that's where one could imagine, is there a way to take down this perception of NATO threat in uh, uh, Georgia? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both to Katie and Julia for these interventions, and we'll let Cornelia have a chance to respond, but first, before we do that, we'll open up the floor, and if you could please introduce yourself when uh, 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 asking your question. So, please, if you go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zaza Bibilashvili. I represent the Chavchavadze Center. Uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Cornelia and his colleagues and, uh, and you guys for organizing this roundtable. Uh, I'd like to make a few comments on, uh, on, on Russia and then on Georgian internal politics. Uh, it is quite unfortunate that some Western scholars and uh, among them some very notable ones like Mersheimer uh, have placed portion of guilt on the West for what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, and they always say that while well, Russia is primarily to blame, uh, this is uh, an understatement to say the least. Uh, of course, the Russians have started this unprovoked premeditated attack. Uh, a 19th, st 19th century style uh, attempt to just erase the country and install a puppet regime. They've now changed the rhetoric because they are suffering uh, uh, losses on the battlefield. But uh, again, to draw a parallel with Georgia, in the beginning of this conflict, uh, the Georgian prime minister was saying that A, supplying arms to Ukraine is not an answer and sanctions against Russia do not work. In fact, these are the only, thing, only two things that work. Uh, now, going back to Russia, I think we can draw many historical parallels of why they're behaving the way they are, uh, including the parallels between World War I and II. Uh, I mean, many have said, and were very actively saying, that the unjust peace of Versailles was why World War II started. And there is a rationale. I mean, if we want to look at it, there is a rationale behind it. Does that justify what happened? Not by any means. Uh, this is what's happening here. I mean, Russians are saying, well, there was a promise not to enlarge NATO, etc., etc. I mean, that mentality has gone. I mean, we are past the stage of spheres of influence, uh, and you do not move your uh, sovereign, you do not use your sovereign territory to use it for a particular purpose. In reality, Russia is an empire which is stuck in between. Uh, the evil empire, which the Soviet Union was, was disintegrated, which is a tragedy for Putin, but not, Russia never became a nation state. Russia never really accepted the Western civilized standards of behavior uh, and all we need, it's, it's not a conclusion, all we need to do is just look at their propaganda, look at what they're feeding their own people. It's obvious. It, it does not need any uh, rocket scientists to, uh, to do that. And the only time and the only way this conflict will be solved is not when they withdraw the troops, but when they accept the international norms as any other, like Norway. And of course, it's very easy to talk to Russia like Norway when you're a member, member of NATO. Uh, and it's very difficult for, for Georgia. In Georgia, that's called appeasement because uh, we don't really have another uh, a, a shield like uh, NATO. Now, going back to, uh, to Georgia, it's very similar. Uh, very often, we just need to pay attention and remember what is out there in the public. Uh, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, when George Dream was uh, preparing to come to power, Ivanishvili published a doctrinal 
article in Wall Street Journal Europe in which he repeated every Russian cliche about Georgia. He said that Georgia is saber rattling and we need to top, stop that. He said uh, that uh, Georgia is becoming a Cuba of the Caucasus and we cannot uh, allow that. He said that, uh, most importantly, that the conflict, conflicts, that's very important, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia are centuries old ethnic conflicts. And uh, basically, it's a Russian narrative, right? It's like Aborigines fighting, fighting each other and Russians coming in to, to make peace. While it's a conflict between Russia and Georgia, very modern, very political, interstate. Uh, when he came to power, and I'll finish in a minute, when he came to power, one thing he did, he did is uh, free all the Russian spies as political prisoners, not just free them, but free them as political prisoners. I mean, we need to stop and think about it once again. Uh, and then our president currently says, as many Russian generals do in Ukraine, that Georgia bombed its own radar in 2007, one year before the war, to blame it on the Russians. So, and I can go on and on and on, but this is all very consistent. Uh, and coming back to your question, Corneli, why are they behaving this way? Uh, I would go even beyond appeasement. In 2014, I published an article drawing parallels between the Vichy government and this government. And basically, the parallel was that Vichy government was fully legitimate. It was elected. It was legitimate. It was just behaving in a certain way, which made it possible historically to brand it as col collaborationist. Thank you very much. So, so that was more of a comment than a, uh, than a question. But, but we have some questions uh, from the uh, from, from Katie and from Julia and give you a chance to, to respond to them and or if you want to comment on the comment and uh, and also for the rest of you please don't feel shy uh, uh, we're open for more questions we have have still uh, plenty of time but uh, maybe we should go to Corneli first thank you Helge um, yes I think everybody understand that uh, you know like Georgia in uh, uh, today's situation cannot maybe pursue the value-based foreign policy, like Lithuania, Estonia, and others, because as uh, Julie mentioned, like in, in Norway, they are already under the umbrella of NATO and European Union, and uh, I mean, of course, they also don't have guarantees they will not be attacked by Putin, but at least they are better off than the country like Georgia, who is actually a frontline state, basically in gray zone, doesn't have any security guarantees, and everybody understands that. But what was the expectation from Georgia, and why we, uh, not only we, but I mean, Georgian society criticizes that there was the expectation, it's not about morality only, I mean, it's not a realist versus idealist kind of, uh, the thing is that Georgia signed association agreement with the European Union, and in this agreement also, it is expected that Georgia should align with the security and foreign policy of the European Union. So it's not like uh, you have, I mean, uh, you can choose something, but you have to somehow, especially now when Georgia formally applied together with uh, Ukraine and Moldova for European Union membership. So how come that, you know, like, you um, you have a, like two phase, and one is kind of like you want uh, to get a European membership, but at the same time you don't want to uh, join sanctions. But I'm not saying that Georgia should introduce sanctions. To, as we all know that Georgia cannot introduce sanctions, and we are dependent in many ways, and especially in our economy, the, to Georgia. But the problem is that you can at least join symbolically. Symbolics really matters here. And especially what uh, Julie was mentioning about Norway model, I agree that Norway, maybe that's a very good model. When you have security umbrella, yes, maybe Georgia also can have a good relations with Russia and pragmatic relations. But the problem here is that, for instance, even if Georgia will uh, halt its NATO membership, which I don't see the, um, any, any time is going to, to happen like that, uh, we don't have a guarantee that now, yes, we heard uh, from Russian officials that may, they may not be actually against EU membership of Georgia and even maybe Ukraine. But we know that this war actually started because of um, Ukrainian accession, uh, association agreement with the European Union. We don't have um, any guarantees that, for instance, after even if Georgia and Ukraine say, OK, we don't want to join uh, NATO. Uh, do we have any guarantees that next time Mr. Putin will not say, oh, now do you know that we have a problem also with the European Union? The, basically, the problem here comes that Russia sees this part of the world as a future 
uh, part of its own uh, strategic, um, I would say, uh, neighborhood. And, uh, you know, they, uh, Russia has its own project, like Commonwealth of Independent States, Erosion Union, CSTO, where, uh, where um, actually it sees these two countries as a part of this. So even if uh, today Russian leaders, uh, they talk about that, uh, you know, like that if Georgia and Ukraine will drop this NATO application, maybe there could be uh, some ways out to seek some sort of accommodation between the countries. I don't believe this because the uh, thing is, I think, comes with the Mr. Putin and with Russian doctrine that, as you probably, uh, you know, like hear from his speech, he wants to recreate not the Soviet Union, but Russian Empire. He's not happy even with Lenin and some other, you know, Soviet leaders because they gave, um, you know, some sort of uh, state uh, institution to Ukraine, Georgia. So this is a this is the reality where actually Russia operates. And coming from this reality, I don't think that Georgia has any chance. Uh, you know, like to not to pursue, for instance, you know, like uh, NATO integration, even though we, of course, know uh, that it is very difficult and it will be more difficult even, uh, uh, even after the Ukraine. But I don't think that, you know, like if Georgia, uh, as we highlighted in our memo, if Georgia stays alone, that's the way out. Because if Georgia gets isolated, and this is where we're going right now, then I don't think that our, uh, you know, aims like to become member of EU or uh, m member of NATO will be become more, uh, much easier. Because if you stay alone with Russia, I think that's uh, that's uh, probably uh, will be very difficult for for a small country like Georgia. Be before we let uh, Levant continue, then a short uh, remark from yeah, Julie. Just a, a Again, a cynical remark. Uh, because uh, all I do is try to get into the head of the Kremlin. And my fear now <laughs> is that with the current regime uh, uh, viewing the world as it does, you might uh, get not only the loss of sovereignty, which you already have in the occupied territories, but you might get the loss of sovereignty over your entire uh, territory. So that's why I think you need to at least have that into your, in your scenario. You know, how can we, <laughs> at least when you work with those different scenarios, that needs to be, you need to be very realistic about that. And then on your, you know, the Russian Empire view, uh, really my uh, experience after years of studying uh, Kremlin discourse is that what the Kremlin wants actually changes and you seem to you seem to think that it's always the same but it actually changes uh, and although it's kind of uh, embroiled in its own conspiracy theory for the time being we don't know uh, what kind of lower ambitions will appear in uh, the Kremlin after this war but we know that it's taking a big big toll uh, on Russia so just I think we need to keep our perspectives open mm. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, uh, touch the two issues mentioned, one by Julie and uh, Katie, that are interrelated with each other. On the one hand, uh, what Julie was talking about right now, uh, loss of sovereignty as opposed to loss of statehood altogether. And um, uh, what Katie mentioned in her talk, um, that the risks cannot be exaggerated. Of course, we understand that. Um, but the problem is, what is the most optimal way of uh, remaining sovereign? What is the most optimal way um, to keep this statehood? And whatever uh, a government uh, policy is, what are its shortcomings um, to, uh, to try and improve it? It's not, uh, um, it's not about, um, I don't know, ambushing uh, uh, government of Georgia, right? Uh, it's, not <laughs> it's about um, taking the uh, strategy that they are uh, adopting and examining it to find nitty gritty uh, uh, problems that uh, arise from it and uh, speak up so that we improve them. Um, or at least that's the ex expectation, that's the intention. Um, however, uh, what we see very often in Georgian politics is uh, 
a high degree of politicization of uh, lots of things and uh, very often uh, issues that should be, as Cornelli mentioned earlier, uh, issues that should be a matter of consensus not only among politicians but also nationwide uh, often become uh, bones of contention. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, nobody in Georgia wants to lose statehood, obviously, but uh, um, clearly at this stage, uh, there is no better way of achieving or maintaining statehood and uh, whatever degree of sovereignty Georgia has left <laughs> uh, without the help of the Western powers. And if we risk uh, our partnership with them, then uh, we are alone with, with Russia and even a weak Russia is very dangerous for us, and that, also, that should also not be underestimated. Thank you. I don't see any hands. Yes, I do, I do. Okay, we have one question there, and then you'll come in, uh, Cornelia. No, no. Great. Uh, yeah, my name is Sonja Schiffers. I'm the director of the Heinrich Böll Foundation South Caucasus office here in Tbilisi. And um, I have two, question, uh, two questions. First of all, thank you very much for your inputs. Um, it's very interesting also to hear the different uh, perspectives. And uh, my first question is about economic dependency, which has been raised by some of you. And to be honest, I've been watching uh, this quite closely for the past years, how um, much more dependent on Russia, uh, Georgia has become economically since 2012. Um, this was part of the promise of normalization also, um, but I don't see many um, well-founded, let's say, discussions about how to now start decreasing it. Um, there are some um, discussions among the opposition, as I understand it, about nationalization of uh, Russian um, businesses, but um, um, maybe, I don't know if that's realistic, um, what are your takes on how um, this dependency could be reduced? Because I see this as a um, promising avenue of something that Georgia could do at the moment also to improve its security, ec economic security at least. Um, and then a second question, uh, not so much about um, Finlandization, but uh, maybe more topical. Um, or, I mean, both issues are very topical, but uh, from the news. So I think yesterday um, the de facto president of South Ossetia said that uh, they will have a referendum on, in, uh, on joining uh, Russia. Um, and to be honest, I was a bit surprised that this was taken up so much because I think he's been announcing this since 2015. Um, but still, of course, the situation now is different and we don't know how um, Russia will respond to it this time. I mean, there have, has been some response, but I thought it was very superficial, so it's not really clear to me. And also they will have de facto elections soon, so maybe this is just an election campaign thing, but I don't know. I also don't want to be naive, so I just want to ask what you think about this. Thank you. Who wants to go first? I can go first. Um, thank you. This is a fantastic question, especially about the uh, economic dimension. I, I do quite a lot of research on the DCFTA, and I think um, my short answer to your question would be to for Georgia to diversify trade partners. Right now, if we look at the numbers, I think Turkey is the first trade partner, and then it's Russia, which is very, very surprising given the DCFTA has been active and in, in force qu for quite a few years now. So. Georgia has to capitalize on its achievements, on the achievements of the government, right, and the bureaucracy that has worked very, very hard to finalize um, uh, these treaties. And I think that could, um, diversifying trade partners could be one way also to reduce and deal with the risks that come with, the, uh, with being attached, too attached to, to Russian economy. Thank you. Just to build on that, what uh, Katie was saying, and actually I want also to refer what she was asking, that uh, one of the reasons actually um, Georgia was getting support from the West was uh, that Georgia was always seen um, as a country 
who uh, has a connectivity problem uh, normally with the West and especially with Europe. But, um, and historically, that was a, a huge problem, uh, even if you compare to Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, but uh, the country um, uh, was gaining uh, reputation because it was considered like permanent laboratory of reforms. And that was the uh, very good image of Georgia. It was not about Saakashvili, it was not about uh, Shevardnadze or somebody's, you know, like personal, uh, I don't know, achievement. This was exactly the image Georgia was enjoying, uh, you know, like this uh, strong support. And if we are losing this image, and it seems like we are already losing because we are not anymore front runner in, in terms of Eastern Partnership. I don't know if the Eastern Partnership still exists. We, we don't know that. We will see this. Uh, but um, Georgia is going back. Uh, and I think that plus the security concerns, which we already, you know, like voiced here, that puts our uh, position a little bit very difficult. And especially if uh, government pursues the foreign policy, which, uh, which alienates our friends. and. Uh, uh, our foreign policy is unpredictable and uh, you know people don't understand what is the logic behind of this then who should they care and why they should care about georgia so i think this is the one of the important thing and also what Katie mentioned i agree with this uh, that of course uh, what's the point to have a free trade agreement with the european union or china if you don't use it it's like to, to use it is to buy the Rolls Royce and to have it in the uh, home, but if you don't use it, what's the point? So that's why the, all our energy should be uh, going to that direction last uh, to, for 10 years. Even association agreement, according to Georgian government, is fulfilled by only 40%. So what we were doing uh, for so many years, and now the country has an uh, ambition to join European Union, and it's, we don't know what will be the outcome of this, uh, of course, but. Uh, basically, we need to do a little bit more on, on side of the homework, and uh, I think that's, that's, uh, that's really important here. Yeah. I think that's a very important message indeed. Uh, Julie, could you respond to the second part of the question? Yeah, I wanted to respond to the South uh, Ossetia uh, question and getting back to how Russian policy actually changes <laughs> more than we might think. And I think uh, in my reading, Russia has been copying uh, the West. So there's a reason why uh, they started off by um, acknowledging the outbreak republics as independent states. It's because it's according to the Kosovo template, which they are emulating. But now things are changing. Um, and I just read a really interesting piece, somebody who had done fairly good nitty gritty interviews this last couple of weeks in the Russian elite. Uh, and I think the title of the article was kind of, now, you know, you know, fuck the West. <laughs> kind of frightening. <laughs> uh, uh, frightening if, that, uh, if that's actually where they're landing at. So with these new sanctions, which are, you know, they're very, very hard hitting. Uh, uh, the broader, even the broader Russian elite might be leaving the West. So maybe there won't be the same need to emulate the West. And maybe then actually the voices who just said, OK, let's just make them part of Russia uh, will uh, be louder and be, and, and be heard. So maybe this time they will uh, recognize. And then I just wanted to add a point on uh, the difference between the EU and NATO, I think we should remember that Russia is still many things, even though the kind of bad elite is definitely now winning out. The reason why there's a difference uh, to play between NATO and the EU is that for those who were the, you know, the Russian reformers, the EU is still a very different thing. NATO always was controversial for the entire Russian elite, actually. So there's something about, you know, it's going to be your neighbor. It's not, you know, there's not much you can do, but there might be something in playing up to the forces on the Russian side of the border, which actually can, you know, in the future bring forth another uh, Russia. And then I think there's a difference between the EU and NATO in the Russian image in general. Yeah, we have time for another one or two questions. So we have one here and one over there. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, I, I many thanks to GIP for the excellent work there they've been doing in this country for last years. So um, now I see that uh, and re resonating uh, what Mr. Bibilashvili said about certain um, neorealist scholars uh, in the area of IR. Uh, whose actual narrative uh, not much uh, differs from the narrative of the Kremlin, and that is very unfortunate to confirm. Uh, and I, I need to remind, actually, uh, kindly remind the, uh, about the situation what uh, uh, prompted the war in 2014 in Ukraine. And probably Corneli already mentioned about that briefly, or maybe Levan. Uh, so I apologize if I'm if I'm not. Uh, quoting correctly in this regard, uh, but uh, it was exactly the willingness of uh, Ukraine to join, not NATO, that was a, 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 the issue outside of the equation. It was the willingness of, of Ukraine to join the European Union. And, the, and those who were in favor of uh, joining NATO by then in Ukraine, it was probably 30% or 25% or something like that. And exactly on that, the Russia reacted on the willingness of Ukraine that was um, pro-European, not pro-NATO, with this brutal force. And um, this is quite paradoxically the neo-realist narrative that, that looks like most appropriate uh, in terms of explaining the ongoing developments, shows its uh, utmost weakness in this regard, theoretically speaking because it leaves aside the probably the most important thing, the drive of nation, the drive of people of Ukraine or Georgia, the majority of them, to make their choice according to their mindset, not according to certain impersonal neorealist uh, forces operating around. And um, yes, it is, it is really unfortunate uh, uh, to, to see that so, so many neorealist Western scholars are actually uh, nearly replicating the narrative coming from Kremlin. So, it, and it is, it is very interesting point. So as I said, paradoxically, the neorealist uh, approach to IR that looks most appropriate uh, at, this, at this point is showing its utmost weakness, ignoring the willingness of nations, of people to, to make their free choices. They, and considering these, these, these nations, considering these, these peoples as some sort of thing in itself. Uh, and a couple of words about the Finlandization. Um, oh, we understand what you mean under that, of course. Uh, but um, as long as uh, it has certain negative connotation uh, behind it, um, I would opt for a more uh, balkanization because it is odd to talk about Finlandization, about the country that is probably the happiest country in the, in the world, according to, to UN surveys. Uh, and so I would opt for, uh, instead I would opt for uh, balkanization rather than, especially taking into account what certain Russian experts are saying right now in terms of dealing with uh, Hungary, with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Romania, with uh, Poland, to dismember Ukraine uh, and make certain deals with, with them, actually literally balkanizing Ukraine rather than Finlandizing it. So that, that, that is my, my uh, comment on that. And just question to Levan, who actually showed us a, a slide when he talks about uh, um, the reasons, uh, the, the problems, so logical problems and, and, um, and uh, per perceptual problems. Um, I wonder whether he meant under perceptual problems, uh, political and, and uh, psychological problems as well. If not, I would uh, ask him, does he think that adding psychological and political problems uh, will make this picture more complete? Thank you. Thank you, and uh, a final question. Um... Okay. Yes, we are running so, out of time. No, no, so, yeah. uh, I just uh, uh, looked at my watch to say, I mean, it's good afternoon or good day or what, 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 how to start, you know my my comments uh, thank you very much first of all my name is george Zeretelli. i'm representing here uh, european georgia political party so 
Uh, and also there's some, some other institutions too, I would not list it at this moment, but uh, 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 being in this position as an opposition polit politician, so you can understand that uh, my everyday job since 2012 to criticize this government and very sharply criticize this government. But uh, uh, thank you very much for, for this really very interesting uh, discussion here, Corneli and the colleagues here, and this uh, uh, Georgian uh, Institute of Politics and our Norwegian colleagues. Uh, I've been many years member of uh, OSC, you know, it's not most efficient institution, I would say, but uh, I was president of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly for the last three years until 2020, and I had a lot of cooperation with the, our Norwegian colleagues, many friends there. I appreciate your involvement here, and I wish to my country one day to replicate all the policies and strategies you have, uh, having uh, economy like in Norway and also having foreign policy like in Norway. Unfortunately, we could not afford it now. And uh, 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 just, just very shortly about the topics, of course, uh, it's good to have more time because everything is very interesting. And we need this discourse, we need this discussion, uh, especially politicians who were inter interacting with public almost every day. So how to formulate all our ideas and to how to transfer to give a message as well, especially now when uh, we see here that uh, unfortunately, Georgian government opted to the worst position possible. Uh, and everything is judged by results. And when you are getting um, uh, a nice, let's say, appreciation and a good words from uh, Mr. Karasin, uh, Deputy, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, at the same time, um, President Zelensky, who is the most popular figure in the world now, criticizing Georgia and talking about the moral position of Georgian government that are calling ambassadors, everything is clear. It's a, that's a very black and white, unfortunately. So uh, uh, there's a main problem, what will be after the Ukraine? Uh, of course, we can uh, hours, we can spend hours to put forward all the facts of wrongdoings of Georgian government during the last eight years, how appeasing Russia and all the, and even even more, we have huge dependence or, on Russian uh, economy now, and it was mentioned here, and uh, and I think uh, uh, most uh, dangerous thing which is government doing here, and uh, playing and capitalizing on fears of people. So if you are talking to be more close to Ukraine to express solidarity better than they, they, they did not express any solidarity, I would say, or support Ukraine as a strategic partner, and also thinking about your future. Immediately, there's a label, there's a party of war, politicians who want the war, and so on and so forth, So, which is, I think, extremely wrong. So sooner or later, uh, there will be agreement, I think. It's impossible, it's a no, uh, let's say other examples, in the latest history, there could be a 10 or 12, 20 years war. There will be, I think, uh, uh, agreement. Uh, it's uncertain what type of agreement it will be, of course. But for Georgia, it's a huge uncertainty at this time having, I would say, this very negative position in the eyes of our partners and West, NATO members or EU members. Uh, we should be a much closest allies uh, to Georgia when it comes time and when it will be necessary. And I think this uncertainty also dependent, it depends on, on the situation in the country. So foreign policy is determined by, <laughs> by, by domestic policies here and politics here. So I think the uh, best solution for Georgia at this moment will be democratic consolidation. Without that, we could not move forward. Uh, and I think uh, that this situation should force all the democratic forces in this country, opposition parties, society, to consolidate and to make this change as soon as possible. Uh, we can, I, I will finish now, of course, uh, as I said, there's a very uncertain situation in the world and we can draw scenarios here, but we will see I think in coming month, 
that uh, something will be more clear. So, but I don't think that Georgia will win, unfortunately, in this situation. And that's, of course, uh, Georgian government's fault, first of all. Thank you very much for your yep. great, uh, let's say, discussion here. So thank you for that uh, intervention and uh, some big questions, and I hope we can continue to discuss them after we, we wrap up here uh, when we do the, the mingling session. But I overlooked one very question. Brief, very Sorry. brief, Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Very brief question. Go ahead. Uh, uh, actually, what Cornell is, uh, Mariam Gersamia, professor at TSU, media psychologist. Cornell mentioned two words in connection with uh, uh, the topic, reputation of the country of Georgia and the image of the country. What if uh, this is the goal to damage the reputation and the image of the country of Georgia? Because from public relations perspective, in nation image building, there are three components, institutions, national identity, and the national interest, how different groups, different political parties, different interest groups are demonstrating that they have one goal and the common national interests. What if this is a goal? And I was just, uh, I, I wonder uh, how you see this. Maybe they have achieved this already. They have damaged the Georgia's reputation in this regard. Thank you. Uh, Salam Iswaninza representing NGO Civic Idea. First of all, thank you very much for a very fruitful discussion. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask you, it has been spread the narrative that um, there might be an establishment of a new kind of alliance within the countries, and how realistic does it seem to you, and what do you think? Uh, will there be any room left for Georgia? as well as it might be a little bit off topic but you have mentioned the chinese factor because within this war china has played like twofold game and from a larger scale perspectives how do you think like will the china remain neutral taking into consideration the very close cooperation with russia and china thank you thank you uh, since we're running out of time, uh, I think we need to be very succinct in our comments here, but let's start from Levan and work our way through the panel uh, with uh, some brief responses to, to the interventions and questions we've okay. got in this um, final round. I would just uh, take two points from the questions. Um, about logical and perceptual problems that was directed at me, uh, whether or not political and psychological problems would make, it, uh, make the picture more complete. Um, the, the framework that this, these ideas are taken from does include political problems. Uh, and this is when politicians, decision makers, do not really um, understand the political context uh, of uh, where uh, the country is operating. Um, and this can, uh, this can happen when uh, um, a given country wants to be a part of a different region that it is not part of. Um, and we can observe such, such problems in, uh, in the history of Georgian foreign policy making as well. Um, but this was not the goal of uh, the paper, so it was not included it. But um, another thing that I wanted to touch was the uh, issue of democratic consolidation. Um, because we've been talking about, Julie mentioned um, uh, the sovereignty versus statehood dichotomy. Um, another dichotomy is democracy versus sovereignty versus, oh, that's not a dichotomy anymore, but versus statehood. Um, the question is, on the one hand, whether or not Russia is uh, okay with Georgia being independent, but another question could be whether or not Russia is okay with Georgia being democratic, because essentially democracy means that people can decide what they want. And what if people decide that they do want to be members of European Union or NATO? This is, um, in, in this logic, uh, uh, Georgia, if, if it has, uh, if it's on the good side of Russia, it's not only not sovereign, but also not fully sovereign, but also not fully democratic. Um, so it adds another layer of, of problems. Um, that we are facing in this current situation. Thank you very much. 
And just very briefly about this reputational damage. Uh, I, I think the, we already have this reputational damage and uh, we're leaving on Sunday uh, to Strasbourg and to um, Brussels actually to find out a little bit more um, what kind of uh, reputational damage actually. We, we cannot probably you know, like, uh, have a exactly scale, but uh, uh, at least we will have understanding. But one thing is clear. Uh, what we know, for instance, is that uh, several um, important organizations in Brussels and uh, uh, also some other places uh, in Europe, basically, they were re very reluctant to engage with Georgian government officials, even to host them. So this is all, and these are the countries who are, who were, uh, I would not say, they, they were a favoring, actually, government before. And uh, so this is something like telling. So it means that this reputational damage is already here. Unfortunately, what we hear, and that's why we want to find out this a little bit more, that there's a different scenario how the European Union will treat this uh, EU application from Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. There is a very bad scenario, what we hear, and I hope this will not be uh, probably the realistic, but uh, in, because of the circumstances of Georgia, there's less sympathy now in EU countries toward Georgia, and there's a, even a discussion about to have uh, to give Georgia uh, some sort of conditionality uh, before they, it gets like uh, this candidate status. So this is this will be a very bad scenario for Georgia because we have now this what what we call this window opportunity, and if Georgia will not use it. I, I don't think that we will have uh, probably another chance because this, this kind of window opportunity just comes once a decade or maybe sometimes uh, like uh, once a 20 years. I'll just make a very, very quick point about a uh, question regarding China and neutrality. I don't think that uh, at least uh, formally China will um, lose its neutrality and clearly stand with Russia because that might have huge repercussions for its relations with the US, but of course informally, and what Julie mentioned, there might be just more boosted cooperation um, within different institutions. And I think also just further propping up BRI, and in countries where EU might not be so strong, or funding and investment, um, funneling more Chinese money, which has not very good impact on the governance, corruption, because of the debt trap. So, it's a short comment. Yeah, so I'll fo follow on from that. Um, I think that it's clear that China's initial neutral position had to do with two things. One, it spoils uh, trade, which is, you know, China's big power status is about trade first. Uh, second, it spoils something that China and Russia has agreed upon namely the principle of sovereignty, which they, they do not want the US to intervene in their own sovereignty. So in the beginning, yes, there's the kind of potential split there, but in the final event, I think that you know, what really glues Russia and China together is their, their agreement that they are against the USA. So I think that's going to be the dominant pattern in the future. And then I just wanted to say, and I think it's important, you know, the explanation um, of the annexation of Crimea and the Russian intervention in eastern Ukraine to the, to the, uh, the gentleman over there, um, that I, I think it's important to be very realistic about that that uh, happening in 2014 had several reasons. I agree, it had to do with the EU, but it also had to do uh, um, uh, uh, with NATO and a host of other uh, factors such as internal politics, kind of commanding a more nationalist type uh, a policy which the Kremlin played to. But I think it's important to see it's the coming together of the different types of West in kind of taking over Ukraine from Russia, which triggers that a reaction. Therefore, I think when we think of scenarios for Georgia, we should still try to um, decipher. Although it might, you know, things might look different uh, after this uh, terrible war. And then I wanted to say more as a kind of uh, uh, support that I agree that uh, the issue of consolidating your democracy in Georgia 
should be the first task in a way regardless of strategizing or thinking in, in scenarios simply for your, uh, for your own sake and I think of that also for a small country like Norway because we also are subjected to pressures you know even if we're in the alliance and uh, so the heart is in a way keeping and consolidating the democracy that we have so I wish you good luck with that. On that note, <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending here uh, this Friday's uh, afternoon's seminar. Um, three things left for me to say. First of all, uh, if you're interested in the work we are doing uh, in this cooperative project between GIP and NUPI, please do visit our Geopath website uh, at NUPI's uh, website, nupi.no. Uh, there you will, will find links to our uh, previous panels, uh, policy memos, and articles. Second thing I wanted to mention is that, as I said initially, there will be coffee. I said it would be here, but actually it's going to be one uh, floor down. So please join us there for continuing this uh, discussion. And the third and final thing uh, I would like to say is, or rather to ask you, is to join me all in a big applause for our panelists here today. Thank you.